The way of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. That's what the scripture says. Show me thy way. Hallelujah. Let the church be the church. Reloaded. If you're anything like me, when you saw that title, you thought, what does it mean? And I said to some of the ministers, what does reloaded mean? So they said, well, it means this. And I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, well, it means this. And I said, well, what does that mean? Because, you know, I'm not so young as I used to be, and I don't get some of this modern terminology. Would you say that was right? Some of you older people? Where are you out there? Yes. <laughs> Let the church be the church reloaded. Now I understood from the message on Sabbath that what that means is that we are looking at a theme that we had in 2013 at Tabernacles and we are looking at it again <coughs> from a different aspect. Is that what you got on Sabbath? And Brother Alcott said, this feast is about our personal responsibility to live the kind of life that reflects the fact that we belong to something incredible. Yes. Did you hear him say that? That's what this feast is about. It's looking at our personal responsibility towards living the kind of life that reflects that we belong to something incredible. And that incredible something that we belong to is the body of Yeshua. And I want to say to you this afternoon, without a doubt, that the body of Yeshua is the most important entity in this world in our day. It's not space travel, it's not the shuttles up there, it's not the satellite disks, it's not technology, it's not this, it's not that. The most important entity in this world in the 21st century in 2015 is the body of the Messiah. And we have a, the enormous privilege of belonging to that body. And we are looking at the body of Messiah or the church, this feast, because we need to see what our responsibilities are. And I've got some things to say to you today about responsibility. And I want to say before I go into that, that what Samuel and what David stood up here and said just before I got up is totally relevant. Because everything I'm going to say to you today is about responsibility, it's about, it's about belonging to this body, it's about functioning in this body, but it's all based on keeping Yeshua in our focus. So these two men that got up here and spoke before me have laid out some pitfalls, but that does not take away from the truth that I want to share. It doesn't take away. It's just going to give you some, some pointers. Be careful. Keep your eyes on Yeshua. But what I hope to talk to you about today is based on the book, the book. And because we believe that the body of Yeshua is Yahweh's will for the 21st century, we have picked up some modern terminology and linked it to the ancient outline of the gifts of the ministry. 
to help to increase our understanding of them, but it's because this, we want the body of Yeshua to know that the fivefold ministry is totally relevant and can exist in our world as a vibrant power tool of almighty Yahweh. It is Yahweh's tool in this world. And so my sermon today is called The Body's Entrepreneur. And when I first saw this title, I said, what has this got to do with what they want me to preach, they? <laughs> but you know, and so I looked it up, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur, it, it, do I know what it is? It's a business person, a tycoon, a capitalist, a mogul. You've heard of all those <coughs> words probably, you still don't know what it means, do you? In the world, um, an entrepreneur is a person who organizes and runs a business or an enterprise and attempts to make it flourish through considerable initiative and risk-taking. An entrepreneur is a go-getter, somebody that gets up there and wants to invest in themselves and they want to make a lot of money and they want to be important or they want to be a success they want to make things work an entrepreneur right somebody that's really good in places and making money so what about the body's entrepreneur i want to say to you that an apostle is no ordinary <coughs> entrepreneur for the simple reason that he is never not any time invested in himself he is totally invested in his master and his master's body <coughs> yes. an entrepreneur in the body of yeshua is the apostle and i want to unpick this for you today to show you how this particular gift works and Al alcott said to me the other day he said and i believe that the entrepreneur of the body of yeshua he said is one who is gifted to build and lead a congregation or organization enabling it to grow and thrive by using considerable creativity, innovation and faith. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it? <coughs> but Alcott said that. I believe that a, a, an apostle is an entrepreneur who can grow and, and grow a congregation, making it thrive. By in, and, and you know they do that by investing in the body. Now, from as, for as long as I can remember, my life has been completely submitted to two directed, controlled by two amazing apostles. One of those is Yeshua, and the other was my father. And what I'd like to do today is just share some insights about growing up with the apostleship. Growing up with the apostleship. I cannot ever remember not being surrounded by apostles. And so I'm saying to you today what is, is now on the screen, that the entrepreneur is set in the body to direct, envision, and equip its members to find and do the will of Yahweh. That is what this ministerial gift is all about. And I'm going to explore this today by looking at what the apostle is, what members can expect from the apostle. And lastly, 
what the apostle can expect from us, the members. Right. Let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. We've had this already. Thank you, Beryl. My dad used to preach this, uh, this uh, from this scripture so much that when he opened his Bible, the pages of Ephesians 4 used to fall out and push them back in. And somebody once said to him, Brother Warsaw, do you have this scripture tattooed on your chest? <laughs> he loved it. And this is the um, Apostle Paul speaking and talking about Yeshua. And he, Yeshua, gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Messiah, until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Yahweh unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Yeshua. Yes. You got that? Yes. Are you there? Does that, is that you? Or have you come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Yeshua? Are you there yet? What did David say? He said, we're not perfect. We're going on to this. And these ministerial gifts are given to the body until we all come. Now I looked up the Greek word apostolos and it means a delegate, an ambassador, a commissioner of Messiah, a messenger, one that is sent, apostolos, an apostle. Basically, the apostle is somebody given to the body and he's gifted with certain qualities. He is a sent one who carries the authority of the one who sent him. You know, I was watching some, a news item some, a couple of weeks ago of our Prince William in, Ch in China. Did anybody see that? And I watched him and I saw that he carries the authority of the throne of England and his grandmother who sent him. He was every inch a prince while being friendly and, and interacting with everybody. I just felt so proud of him. He is every inch a prince. An apostle is someone who carries the authority of the one who sent him. And the, the, the apostles are sent by the head of the body, who is Yeshua. Yes. They have a certain authority. The apostle is the first in order of ministry. If you, if you check out the, the Corinthians chapter 12, it will, you'll find it says, apostle, firstly apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers, and after that, the apostle is part of a network of ministerial office totally committed to perfecting, equipping, and edifying Yeshua's body. He's part of that. And his primary function is to perfect the government and administration of the body. Now, each of these five gifts perfect something in particular. And I'm not going to go anywhere else except the Apostle. His uh, primary function is to perfect the government and the administration in the body. Now then. <clears throat> I want to clear something up here. Because many thousands of theologians and Christian people, probably millions, but many thousands, believe that the apostolic gift faded out when the 12 apostles died. And these people believe that Matthias, let's just turn to the um, first chapter of Acts, chapter, chapter 1, verse 26. You bring your Bibles because you know Val always puts the scriptures up, don't you? 
Well, this is one I decided this morning to read to you. <clears throat> Which, you know what happened on the night Yeshua died, don't you? Do you? Do you remember that? Do you remember that somebody called Judas betrayed him with a kiss? Remember that? And then Judas went out and killed himself because he was so full of remorse. Judas had to betray Yeshua. That was part of the plan. And it had to be one of the very, very close people because he, was, he knew what was going on. And on that last supper night, there was only the 12 apostles and Yeshua. Now, most of the time, in fact, I would say all the time, there was more than 12 apostles with Yeshua. There were a lot of people who were with him all the time. And in this upper room, Peter stood up and said, look, there's a scripture that says, and it's in verse 20, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted and there be no one to dwell in it. That's what happened. Judas committed suicide. His place was deserted. And then the psalm said, may another take his place of leadership. So there had to be 12 apostles. Now this is what Peter said. Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time Yeshua went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Yeshua was taken up. Now the, the new apostle, the one that was going to be drafted in, had to have been around all that time. Now thousands of quite well respected theologians believe that the twelfth apostle was Paul and that Peter made a mistake here on the day, uh, in the upper room before Pentecost. Now I'm saying to you they chose two men, they chose somebody called Joseph and they chose Matthias and then they cast lots which was a, something that Yahweh taught them to do on, under this is actually the last time you see in the scriptures of them casting lots it, because after this they got filled with the Holy Spirit. They cast lots, and, and that way, Yahweh gets to choose between Matthias and Joseph. And the lot fell to Matthias. So Matthias came on board as one of the apostles of the Lamb. And when you read in, in, um, in Revelation about the 12 elders and the 12 apostles of the Lamb, the 12 apostles of the Lamb include Matthias, because this was not a mistake. And do you know how I know? I know because Yahweh is never ashamed of telling us that his prophets and his apostles got something wrong. And it never tells you that they got this wrong. It never tells you that Peter was put into the twelve. Uh, sorry, that Paul was put into the twelve. So this was not a mistake. I, I think um, I think we have to be to be clear that Matthias became an apostle, Paul was an apostle, Barnabas was an apostle, James, who was Yeshua's brother, not the James that was in the first group, James, Yeshua's brother, he was an apostle. <coughs> Silas and Timothy are listed as being among the apostles. There were many apostles, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, that probably Apollos was, a prof was an apostle. But that's my personal opinion. But there are lots of records of apostles more than the twelve. And I believe that people who think I believe that, that, that Matthias was a mistake, they are that the people that teach that are basing it on the assumption that there were never more than twelve. And, and that is not scriptural. So, and you know, it's the, the apostolic office is one of those things that, that does not exist in mainstream Christianity. They do not uh, um, recognize the gifting. They recognize teachers, they recognize prophets, they recognize um, pastors, they recognize deacons, they recognize elders, but you do not hear them talking about apostles. Why? Prejudice against a gift and ignorance 
don't alter the facts. And what I'm saying to you is when in doubt, check out the word. And as far as I can see, this word gives ample, um, what's the word? Evidence. Evidence, thank you. Ample evidence that the gift of the apostle is alive and well. Right, let's have a look at, um, all right. The scripture that we had a look at earlier, it said until, that Yahweh has given these gifts until we all come. And these gifts are going to be needed until his body in every age is brought to complete unity. The apostle is needed until members of the body are brought into the likeness and image of Yeshua, until holiness throbs in every being, until this is achieved, the apostles are here to stay. And we have to do business with the apostles that Yahweh has raised up in this congregation. We may be small in number, but we are privileged to have understood the work of an apostleship. We are privileged to sit under the ministry of anointed apostles. We are privileged to see that what Yahweh has said he will do, he is doing here. This is a privilege. Of course, the most notable and the chief of apostles, we already had this today, he was Yeshua. And Yeshua said, I am among you as one who serves. I am among you as one who serves. Um, Beryl read that scripture, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Consider him. David and, Rach, uh, David and Samuel both talked about keeping your eyes focused on Yeshua. He is the apostle. Throughout his entire life, he functioned as an apostle. And all the men who came up under him, they were like, being a pre they were like apprentices, or mentees, we would call them today. He was mentoring them. And they all became ap 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 apostles because he reproduced who he was in them. And the, the proximity of their relationship and the endless discussions and, 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 and Yeshua's example and the way he worked and so on, it grew them and matured them and re re reproduced the image of Yeshua in them. And if you want to know what an apostle is like, look at the 12 apostles because they're so different. But because Yeshua is so immense, all 12 of them together were still only a reflection of who he is. So one apostle is not enough. We have in this congregation, we are blessed to have more than one apostle. They cannot show us Yeshua on their own. It's not an isolated gift. And if you want to, the, the, the apostles were commissioned to preach the gospel and to build congregations. An authority from Yeshua accompanied them and still does today, as I've said already. They have a special inspiration or anointing of the Spirit. You must feel that coming from an apostle. And if you don't feel that, then there's either something wrong with the gift that's, that, that's ministering or there's something wrong with your receptive. <coughs> Apostles tend to make the heart burn when they're talking. They speak to the innermost parts of us. They have a special anointing of the Spirit. They can bring revelation and understanding of the Scriptures. Paul did that. Signs and wonders uh, accompany them. And you know, signs and wonders, exploits, it's not always miracles of healing. That, yes. Others too. They are faith oriented, driven people. Faith is a quality that Yeshua was always trying to build up in his apostles. I worked 
very closely with an apostle. Most of my working life, about 45 years, I worked in the congregation's admin department, various different jobs. And one day, my dad walked into my office with a, a letter in his hand. And he said to me, have you seen this? So I said, no, what is it? So I threw it on the desk. So I picked it up and I said, um, yes. Well, what do you think of it? I said, well, it, it, it's the annual statement from the building society. I think it was the Bedford House. I can't remember exactly which, but I think it was the Bedford House. And he said, look at it. I said, yes, I'm looking at it. He said, how much have we paid off the X number of pounds that we borrowed? So I had another look and I said, well, well, actually, we haven't paid anything off. <laughs> exactly! He said, we have been paying X number of pounds every month for the last 12 years and the big m m number there hasn't gone down by one pound. We've just been paying off the interest. So I said, um, I, th I think that's how it works. <laughs> so he said, we're not giving you, that's Yahweh's money that's going to those building society and Yahweh's not financing the building societies of England, his money is for his work. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, ring up, get out all, the, I think we had three or four at the time, I don't remember, mm. get out the mortgages, he said, ring up all the building societies and ask them how much it will cost to, to, to clear, the, clear the mortgage. So I said, uh, okay, and then what? Well, pay them. I said, okay, that there's just, just a little problem. We don't have any money. That is not our problem. We are going to pay these because we're not putting money into the building societies of England. So, I said, right, do you want me to do that now? Yes. Now? Yes. We had a saying, Shirley, you'll probably remember this, in, uh, when we were all working in the congregation's offices. All right, Dad, do you want me to rush that rush job before I rush this rush job that I'm rushing now? <laughs> because everything, Dad always wanted everything yesterday. Yes, I had to stop. I had to run them up. And I got the figures. And I watched how, very quickly, Yahweh helped us to pay off those debts. What did he do? He went down to the bank. And he said to the bank manager he, he, he wanted to pay these off. So he wanted to borrow some money. So we, so we said to him, Dad, if you're, paying, if you're borrowing it from the bank, isn't it like borrowing it from the building society? He said, no. Because when it's the overdraft in the bank, that's Yahweh's business and he can clear it up for us. And he did, you know. And the bank manager, this wouldn't happen in this day and age. But early, early, early in the history of this congregation, about 1970s, the bank manager was a gentleman from Wales. Very friendly with my mum. And my dad was going down for a big, he was always going down to the bank to borrow money. <laughs> and he went in there one day, came to, the, came to us all, it, we, we were, he said, right, everybody, he said, well, today I want you to pray because I'm going down to the bank to borrow X number of pounds, and it was a lot. Um, and I just want you to ask Yahweh to, to give us favour. So we said, all right, dad. So a, few, a, bit, a, a bit later on in the day, he came back and he was looking a bit bemused. He went into the bank manager's office and he said, um, oh, Mr. So-and-so, I've forgotten his name, he said, uh, we, I, I want to borrow X number of thousand pounds. The bank manager said, oh, all right, Mr. Warsop. <laughs> he said, my dad said, you don't want to know what it's for? I said, no, you, you want to borrow this from us, that's fine. And my dad said, I don't understand. He said, Mr. Warsop, I've noticed 
that any, he said, your congregation gives um, fairly regular donations and we get about the same amount of money coming in every month. But every time you ask to borrow money, he said that, that amount goes up and up and up and up until you've paid it off and then it goes back down again. Yahweh's people doing exploits, do you know that? Uh, we don't know how that happened. We never talked about money too much. Yahweh just used to send it in. And it was so apparent that the bank manager noticed. And then, of course, there arose a bank manager that knew not Peter Warsop and then. <laughs> but you know, Yahweh is good. And I believe it, it was my father had faith. My mum, she liked to save up for things. She was always holding her head and going, oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. <laughs> but he wanted, if Yahweh told him to do it, he wasn't going to wait till he had the money. He was going to do it and let Yahweh pay the bill. And because right at the beginning, he made a big mistake. He, he took out an HP agreement on something. I don't know whether it was a heater. It was something. Um, he took out this HP agreement, because we didn't never had any money. There was never very much coming in. They didn't have a wage. We lived by faith. So it came round for the monthly payment. And you remember HP? Yes. I have purchased. And he said, um, he went to Yahweh and he said, Yahweh, it's time for the payment on this, whatever, this heater or whatever it is. And Yahweh said to him, you bought it, you pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> he never forgot that. But you know, Yahweh works with who we are. Yes. He works with who we are. He respects who we are. My dad, he knew if he talked to my dad, my dad was going to rush off and do it. He knew if he talked to me, I was going to think about it for six months. Yeah. So you know when he wanted me to do something here, he started six months earlier to get me ready. And I've worked that out. Over the years, Yahweh works with who we are. <coughs> an apostle is an entrepreneur. My, my father... <coughs> Um, was he, he said Yahweh had told him to take care of his people. And, and the way he was doing that in the 70s was to bring us together into communities and teach us how to work and grow us like Yeshua grew the apostles. And because of that, we, were, we, we had, um, we had a, a vested interest in everything that was going on. Alcott said this, an apostle of Yeshua has the capacity to be creative, to innovate, and to make things happen. And now I've remembered what it was. At the time, because he, he was, he, uh, my dad was, was, was concentrating on looking after Yahweh's people and not spending Yahweh's money with the building societies, we bought all kinds of property when the property market was very low, just before the big boom, when it all went up sky high. And I'm saying that without realizing it, he was an entrepreneur. That's what entre yes. entrepreneurs do. They buy cheap and they sell expensive. And you know, we bought cheap properties, not because we were investing Yahweh's money, but because we were taking care of Yahweh's people. And that has bloomed into, this is what is keeping this congregation afloat, is the investments that were made in the 70s. That is still keeping this congregation afloat today because Yahweh had an entrepreneur steering this boat. Yes, he did. And so, I'm not, I'm not saying he was a perfect because nobody is, are they? But he had a lot of things going on that made him an apostle of choice. What is an apostle? He is somebody that has the capacity to be creative, to innovate, and to make things happen. So what do we as members expect from the apostle? We, because they're sent, they come with a divine gifting that members should be aware of and we should respect. 
we, need, we, we, we must expect a message of the kingdom inspired by and delivered with the authority of the master. We must expect that. We must expect compelling vision that results in growth. We must expect regular challenges regarding our walk and standards of holiness. They will constantly challenge us. The Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 1 verse 13 to 16, it says this, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Yeshua is revealed to the world. Do this, this is the Apostle Peter giving instructions. You must live as Yahweh's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living, David, to satisfy your own desires. Don't slip back there. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as Yahweh who chose you to be holy to, who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy, for I am holy. Yes. This is the Apostle Peter yes. saying this to the people, the Messiah's body, in the first century. And we hear this again and again from this platform. People being challenged to be holy from the apostles in the 21st century because the message has not changed. We have changed, the world has changed, uh, the way we live has changed, but the requirements of Yahweh's Holy Spirit and his own personal holiness have not changed. The commandments have not changed. Yahweh's expectations of his people have not changed. And we must expect our apostles to constantly turn us back towards that. We might, we might get fresh understanding of scriptures in relationship to the purpose of Yahweh today, but it will be revelation that does not take away from anything that has gone before. And if it doesn't measure up with this book, brothers and sisters, Yahweh didn't send it. Because the word is the word is the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. Yeshua is the living word of Yahweh. And he is as real and powerful today as our apostle, as the chief apostle, as he ever was in the first century. He is still here. And blessed are those who hear his voice. Blessed are those who focus in on him. Blessed are those who give their lives in service to him. Blessed are those who recognize and see him working through an apostolic gift and Submit themselves. Blessed are they. Blessed are they. The Apostle John, he said, if someone claims, I know Yahweh, but doesn't obey Yahweh's commandments, that person is a liar. The Apostle John said in the book of Revelation, liars will not get in to the city, to the kingdom of heaven. If I am a liar, I am not going to be with Yeshua. How does that feel? If I say I know Yahweh and I do not obey his commandments, I am a liar and I'm not living in the truth. Everyone who sins is breaking Yahweh's law for all sin is contrary to the law of Yahweh. Yes. Sometimes an apostle will speak out and it will hurt. Do you remember when Yeshua said to Peter, get away from me, snake Satan. You're a dangerous trap for me. Yeah. That was to Peter. Apostles will give us direction, they will give, a, give us guidance. Do you remember when they set up the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 so they could talk about the Gentiles who were coming into the congregation and how much of the law they should observe and so on and so on? That was a direction and guidance that, that they gave there. 
when when the Greek widows weren't getting as much was it he, when the widows weren't getting fair portions, they set up another committee, direct guidance. The apostolic office will create an environment in which members can discover their gifts. They will offer constant encouragement and opportunity for members to grow in that gifting and to work for the good of the body. Yes. They will create an environment. We had a, a wonderful environment here this morning, right at the beginning when we were worshipping. That was wonderful, wasn't it? An environment created by the Holy Spirit working in the worship team. The Apostle will create an environment where our gifts can grow. And I asked myself, what kind of an environment is it? Did your gift grow? Did you grow when you were worshipping this morning? Or were you just pouring out your heart to Yeshua? Mm. My memories of the environment in which I grew the most are not very good. They're not very good. I remember spending years, it seemed like years, it was probably three or four years, painting, burning off paint, repainting, decorating, cleaning, scrubbing carpets, mending furniture. Why? Because my dad had this vision that a home should be created where Yahweh's people could be trained. My sister over there, she used to, every, every day, she used to make a work list and in the evening, everybody used to go to the, the notice board at Covenant College and groan when they saw the work list. And we were expected to do what my sister said from nine o'clock, from seven o'clock till 9.30 was it, every evening. Not because my, my, my sister, she was working with an apostle who, was, who organized her to do that. And you know, the thing was that was people like myself and Sister Rachel, we were the only ones that were around all day in the beginning. And when we took over Baker Street, which many of you won't remember at all, Rachel and I got up every day and started work at half past eight in the morning and finished between half past eleven and midnight it was before Abigail was giving us set hours she was quite kind <laughs> and we painted and we scraped and we painted and we painted and we scraped and we worked and we worked and we had overalls when they got washed once a week and came out of the wash, they would stand up on their own <laughs> because they were so covered in paint. And we couldn't have a, a new one yet because there was you know, still a bit of life left in them. <laughs> that was my mother's part. <laughs> <laughs> work programs. How many people remember work programs? Oh, yes. It was an environment. I, I went to my dad one day and I said to him, when are we going to go out and win souls? He took hold of me by the shoulders and he said, hang on in there girl, do you think this is not killing me as well? But I can only do what Yahweh is telling me to do. And eventually, as you know, we did that. I was thinking this morning about Shirley. Were you indeed? 1980. Shirley's older than she looks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley and I, and in, the, in the, um, the early autumn of 1980, we were working on a movie. Don't we, Shirley? Mm. 
because 1980 Tabernacles, we were going to have a massive celebration because we'd been in Nottingham for 20 years. And my mum was driving everybody to make sure all the bills were paid, all the overdraft was cleared, and she was going at it from that angle. And Shirley and I had been given this task of making a movie. Now, I'm a movie, I like making, I like taking movies. This was good old Super 8 movie. Some of you have never heard of that, have you? Because it's so old. Yes. I've got a lot. And Shirley and I were putting together, out of all these hours and hours and hours of film, we were putting together an hour and a half to show at the banquet of what it had been accomplished in the 20 years. And it was about, it was two, or three, two and a half to three weeks before the feast. And it was <laughs> half past 11 time at night. <laughs> And Shirley and I were in my office at the desk and there was the, the projector and the screen and I'd got strips of film round my neck and Shirley got stacks of tapes. <laughs> you know, you know those old fashioned cassette tapes that you used to play? Those kind, wasn't it? Yeah, we, yeah. we didn't have CDs. No, but no. <laughs> so I had stacks and stacks of tapes and we were, we were having problems. <laughs> and we were trying to sort it out, and the films, the, oh, there was all sorts of things going wrong, and in walks my dad. <laughs> Hello, girls. How are you doing? So, oh, 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 oh. oh he wasn't in bed either. <laughs> Nearly everybody else was. How are you doing? Well, we're having a few problems. We're getting there, says Mrs. Mrs. Optimist. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there, Dad, we're getting there. I wonder, I've been thinking about the first day of the feast. <laughs> and I was wondering if, if you could um, sing the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and at the same time, she says, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Dad, look at all this. I said, we've been at this for, for days. We haven't nearly finished. What, what, what do you mean? So he said, I just thought it's all, it's all right if you can't do it. <laughs> I, wait, she shouted. Wait. So he comes back in, into the room. What do you mean? He said, well, I thought, you know, put it to music. Do something with it. Madam over there, who is, is older than she looks. <laughs> <laughs> she said, um, oh, I think it's a great idea. We need a challenge. <laughs> I look around the room, there's films everywhere, there's all this round. I said, what's this? She said, oh, yes, but this is a musical challenge. <laughs> so you know what? Two and a half days, two and a half weeks later, we sang the Ten Commandments of the first day of the feast, and it was amazing. Yes, it was. <laughs> An environment. It was hard work, wasn't it, Jen? It was hard work. We had to write the music, we had to practice the songs, we had to learn the tunes, we had to put some harmonies together, and we did it. And from that grew all the musicals and the ministry of, of, of the writing music for the scriptures and so on. All of that grew an environment to change lives. Yes. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I did um, some personal um, study on Ephesians 4 verse 12. Thank you for the back there. And this is, um, this is my, um, this is the Valerie Warsaw amplified version. This is what I got from it by looking at all the words that the ministry gifts are for the perfecting and complete furnishing or full equipping of those consecrated to Yahweh that they might be occupied in service towards the promotion of spiritual growth within the body of Messiah that they might be occupied to, that they might to, in, in service towards the promotion of spiritual growth within the body of Messiah till we all come. And I think Alcott said it's not the minister's job, 
it's everyone's job. We are all to be occupied in this service to promote holiness within the body. And I want to say this to you. When our cult was preaching on Sabbath, something that Yahweh said to me years ago came back into my mind. Yahweh said to me one summer, the shepherds are not the people that produce the sheep, the new lambs. It's the sheep that have lambs. So the shepherd's job is to create the right environment for the sheep to produce lambs. Yeah. We are all in this together. Yes. We are all involved. I think also, I want, you to, I want to say this as a, as, a, as a caution. We need to be aware that it should be clear that the apostle has been with Yeshua. Yeshua's 12 disciples were constantly with him. After the ascension, it says, it used to say, they took note that these men had been with Yeshua. And people need to be able to say of our apostles, these people, these men, and sometimes these women, they have been with Yeshua. They have to be filled with the Spirit. And their work, their apostolic work, has to be a accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Mm. They can carry great authority. And that authority must be handled toward the body of Yeshua with grace and love and humility. Mm. An apostle will be humble. Yahweh's word to his people will always work out in the apostle first. The apostle Peter couldn't say, be holy, if that word hadn't worked out in him first. And we can expect to see an apostle groveling before Yahweh and crying out to Yahweh because what he has for us will have to work out in him first. Let the church be the church. And in to do this we must let the ministry be who they have been created to be. Let the apostle be the apostle. Expect him to lead us but be prepared to follow. I'm just going to, for, um, going to talk about for a few minutes what the apostle will expect from us, from the members. The ultimate goal of the fivefold ministry, of which the apostle is first, is, thank you, um, Aunt Audrian, that it might develop. And this is from the Amplified Bible, the, the verse that we've been reading a lot. Until we all attain oneness in faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of Yahweh. I mean, till we get the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of Yahweh, that we might arrive at really mature manhood. This is what it's all about. The completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Yeshua and the completeness found in him. This scripture, in this translation, is never wearisome. You can read it again and again and see something fresh in it. This is what we're about. And the, the apostle has the vision of this. He knows what Yahweh wants for his people. He has a vision of how that can be accomplished. <coughs> he knows where we should be going and what we must be doing. And what my experience of working with a dedicated visionary apostle is that it is always a challenge. And, and the apostle will always expect more of you. And this is, is often more than you think you're able to give. And that's not necessarily finance. But more often than not, you feel that what he's asking you to do, I can't do it. Yeah. If I had a thousand pounds for every time I said, I can't do this and ended up doing it, the church would, would have a bit more money. <laughs> because my, my dad used to say I had a favorite saying, four words, more is in you. Do you say that to you? Sean? Absolutely. More is in you. More is in you. Mm. 
I had learned to say, I'll try. I'll try. Because I have learned that if an apostle says, oh, I feel that you should so and so and so and so, that to try pulls Yahweh on board, pulls the Holy Spirit on board, and affects growth and change within me. Doing things you can't do is a spirit, is a, is a life changing, gift enhancing experience. We didn't know we could sing the Ten Commandments until we sat down and sang yeah, it. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. We didn't know that we could create musicals from the, from the very living word of Yahweh until Yahweh anointed us to do it. We had to go hand in hand with the Spirit who trained us, following the vision I remember when Dad said to me, um, before one feast, he said, do you think you could um, do something with the book of Malachi? <laughs> I said, uh, Malachi? And he said, uh-huh. So by this time, you know, I've, I've got past the don't be daft. I said, well, I could have a look at it. I could have a look at it. I said, why? He said, because I think that's the theme that Yahweh is giving me for the feast. So I said, are you saying that you would like us to do a musical presentation of the whole book of Malachi on the first day? He said, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen that presentation of Malachi, it is on DVD. And I'm telling you that working on that was absolutely wonderful. Yes, it was. It was absolutely wonderful. Yahweh gave us so many beautiful songs, gave us so much beautiful interpretive dancing. So everything was so beautiful. It was just, it just flowed. Why? Because we submitted ourselves to the impossible. Yes. And Yeshua, he had great expectations of his apostles, of the people who followed him, of his disciples beyond the twelve. He never expected less than everything. Everything. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and die. Divides alone. He said, if any person wills to come after me, let him deny himself. And this is amplified. Disown himself. Forget. Lose sight of himself and his own interests. Refuse and give up himself. Now, I want you to know that I'm not saying that what Samuel said to us today is wrong. Because Samuel, what you got was right. But you have to marry that with this. And you can't lose sight of yourself and give up yourself and forget yourself if you haven't got your focus on Yeshua. That's the only safe way. We cannot do this in our own strength. Otherwise, we're facing a breakdown. I have one too, so I know exactly what he's talking about. You've got to keep your eyes on Yeshua. Cleave steadfastly for me. Conform wholly to my example. Conform wholly. Yeah. And if need be, in dying also. For whosoever would preserve his life and save it will lose and destroy it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he will preserve and save it from the penalty of eternal death. Yeshua never requires less than everything. And this that Yeshua said is the foundation of the expectation of the Apostle in this body. Working in the spirit of Yahweh, motivated by his divine vision, Apostles have a right to expect Yahweh's people to be dedicated, submitted, obedient and available. Mm. 
the relationship between the apostle and the body must be built on respect and love. Apostles must take time to earn the respect of the body. Their lifestyle and personal commitment should be exemplary. Then we can follow them. They can expect us to be devoted to the message, to be serious about our calling, to imitate the apostles in their devotion, to respond positively to the direction and challenges that they will bring to us concerning the development of their gift. Alcott said this on Sabbath. Be committed to the disciplines that enable us to grow. Be open to embrace the vision received. The apostles can expect this of the membership because there is a clear pattern that this is how the membership responded to the apostle in the New Testament. And I want to just fit something in here because I want to know how many people on Sabbath had their ears open. We had an apostle. Thank you, Adrian. We had an apostle standing here on Sabbath. And what did I hear him say? I heard him say, Stop going to church. <laughs> did he say that? Yes. Did anybody else hear that? Stop going to church. And then he said, Start learning to be the church. Because the church is not the building, is it? The church is the people. And he said we had to be together in order to work together. And he said this, to remain in the body we have no alternative to being trained and equipped. He said, not to know what you are supposed to be doing after a couple of years is unacceptable. This is what was said to us on Sabbath in this place. And I want to know, did you have your ears open? And have you heard that? And are you thinking and praying about how that is going to affect your life if it is not affecting it already? We have to hear that because the apostle that Yahweh has set over the national congregation in England said that to us from this pulpit. We have to do business with that. We have to do business. <coughs> we are, I'm coming to my conclusion. Apostles are like trustworthy shepherds. Do you know that? They're like watchmen who call out to warn of danger. Their care is deep, genuine, because they were appointed by Yahweh, and Yahweh knows whom he can trust. And the apostles will eventually give account to him. I want to leave this scripture with you from Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to Yahweh. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. That's a bit scary, isn't it? Do you find that scary? We have to learn to trust our souls and our lives to this divine gift because Yahweh is the one who is ultimately watching over us. And he severely disciplines any minister who deals wrongly with his people or leads the flock wrong. So if I am being obedient to the ministry gift set over me and he has made a mistake, I'm not going to get into trouble. The minister is. My experience is that ministers who truly love Yahweh and his people do not make hasty decisions. And if they make a suggestion, consider that it's probably a lot more than a suggestion. And when you're praying about it, 
Ask the RA if you actually have any options. <laughs> the apostle is placed first in the order of ministry. They are all placed in this body for our good. The body of Yeshua is the visible manifestation of the invisible Elohim. I'm going to come right back to the beginning and say it is the most important entity in the world today. 